Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Good morning. It's a, a pleasure to be here and, and uh, an honor to be part of this Psalms of Summer series. Um, I've been enjoying it. I enjoyed making a summer playlist that uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much here, except that I struggled to f- keep only 25% of it to be the OC Supertones on my summer <laughs> playlist. So uh, I invite you to go check that out on Spotify. I would uh, love to share that with you. But uh, this sermon that I'm sharing with you today. It was born out of a letter I wrote to my friend Chris Teixeira a few years ago when he was going through an intense time in his life. I know many of you know Chris, and some of you you guys know him a lot better than I do, Uh, but for those of you who don't know, Chris and his wife Kathleen, they went to Radiant before they moved to the Central Coast, and a couple years ago, Chris got very sick. One night, uh, he, he started having trouble breathing, and he started coughing up blood, and they rushed him to the emergency room and, and saw that his lungs were filling up with blood, uh, and so the surgeons were rushing to try and stop that, and actually had to airlift him down to the USC Medical Center in LA, and uh, they were able to fortunately stop the bleeding and, and save his life, but uh, they didn't know where it was coming from or what was causing it. Much later, they would find out that it was a a fungal infection inside his lungs that were creating these hard little pellets that that actually rattled around and uh, were were damaging his blood vessels inside. But at the time, they didn't know that, and they just had to sit there and, and wait and observe, find out what was going on. He sat in the hospital for a week, and they couldn't find anything. They didn't know what was going on, so they finally were gonna release him. But on the day they were gonna release him to the hospi- from the hospital, the bleeding started again. And this time it was worse, and uh, the, they rushed him into surgery and were desperately trying to stop the bleeding, but they didn't know where it was coming from. Uh, and it was grim. The, the doctors very seriously did not think he was gonna make it. Um, and as a last ditch effort to save his life, uh, they put him in a medically induced coma uh, for 10 days so they could uh, put him on a ventilator and, and try and get things under control. And fortunately, they did. Um, th- th- his, he did not die, uh, but he was in a coma for over 10 days. And as he, um, when he came out of it, the doctors told him that the damage to his lungs was so severe that his only hope for living a, a normal life was to have a lung transplant. Um, and that not only that, but the damage was so bad, he was jumped up to second on the list in all of Southern California. And, uh, and here's this guy, I mean, he, he's my age, and he has a wife, and, and he had a young daughter, um, and he's just sitting in the hospital for over a month, uh, waiting, and, and in pain, and afraid, and, and depressed, and during that time, a lot of us here at Radiant, we were visiting him. We were uh, praying for him. And one Sunday morning uh, during worship time, I, I felt God putting on my heart to pray for Chris and, and that he wanted me to, to write to Chris and, and encourage him, um, and specifically to encourage him from the scripture. And me being me, uh, my first idea was, cool, I'm going to write him a letter. I'm going to encourage him, and I'm going to give him some advice on how to face suffering. Because if you're in pain and you're in suffering, the first thing you want is unsolicited advice from someone who's (laughs) not in that position. Um, But fortunately, uh, God is far wiser than I am. And uh, in the process of writing this letter to Chris, I felt him showing me that what he wanted to share with Chris was not so much advice, but more on simply knowing who he was and and what he had done uh, for Chris. And also as I wrote this letter, I I got the distinct feeling that this letter wasn't just for Chris, uh, that God had something he wanted to share with Radiant Church. And so two years ago, I I spoke with Travis, and I told him, hey, I've 
kind of got a sermon um, ready to go. If there's ever a Sunday where we don't know what, what to do, just call me. I, I got it. Um, and, and Travis said thanks. And um, <laughs> there, there hasn't been an opportunity until now. Uh, but I do think that God knew what he was doing. Uh, God had a plan in that. Because when I heard about this Psalms of Summer series and Travis asked me to speak, I knew immediately that this was the sermon I was going to share. But I was f- afraid that in talking about suffering and in talking about, like, what God says you're suffering, I'd be sticking out like a sore thumb. Because when we've made the playlists of summer songs, summer songs are fun. They're breezy. They're lightweight. And, and I figured that the Psalms of Summer series would be kind of like that. Together we would, we would rejoice in what God had, has done, and he would, we would uh, sing praise the Lord together, and it would be fun. And then here I would be like, hey, guys, I'm going to talk about suffering, and, and it would be awkward. Um, but if you've been here the past month and a half, that really hasn't been the case. Um, uh, Travis and Jared opened up the series uh, sharing psalms that David wrote in times that his life was in danger and he was crying out to God to save him um, because he was afraid he was going to be killed. Then Pam came and she shared how God led her and her husband through some scary times in, in serving him and that when her husband got sick with cancer, um, they prayed for his healing, but then he actually died very quickly from it, and, and she needed God's hand through that. Um, Mike came, and he shared about church planning and how frustrating that's been so far and how little fruit he's seen. Um, and, and then Jill shared about growing up with disability and the deep-seated rejection she felt from that, and how unloved and how unlovable, and she needed uh, God to speak into her heart. And then Juanita shared last week about sin, particularly sexual sin, and, and confession, and the heaviness of that. And so, really, I kind of fit right in. Um, <laughs> and and it's, it's been a heavy summer here at Radiant Church. <laughs> and, and it's kind of funny to think about, but Really, I think God has something to tell us because I know that this past year, this past six months, has been a hard time for a lot of you in this church. I know that that there's been death in our body. There's been tragedy. There's been miscarriage. There's been abandonment. There's been a lot of waiting for a lot of people. There's been diagnoses of of debilitating illnesses. And these are just the stories that I know about. I I know that there are a lot of you who I don't know and who are sitting here uh, in this congregation holding things in that are, you're walking through physical pain right now or, or emotional pain or spiritual pain. Well, let's be honest, probably all three at the same time. And I want you to know that, that I've been praying that you would be here this morning, that, um, that you, would, you would get here. And I think, I'm, just, I'm glad you're here. I think God has something to say to you this morning, some things he wants you to know about himself and what he's done. And I want, you to tell, I want to tell you that, first of all, that God does heal. Okay, our God works miracles. He is a good father. But today... Today's focus, he does do that, but today's focus is going to be on the times when we're still waiting. When he hasn't healed yet, or, or, or he's chosen not to heal, or at least not yet. And so th- that's where we're going to go today. And for those of you who are here and you're, you're not experiencing suffering right now, uh, life is going pretty good. Praise God, that's awesome. I'm glad you're here too, and I pray that uh, as I speak, you would hear what God is saying, you would store it away. Uh, in your soul for a rainy day, and a time when, uh, when, this, when you may walk through this. Because let's be honest, aren't we all just a, a single phone call away from our life changing dramatically? Every, there's not a single person here who is not one doctor's visit away from everything you knew being turned upside down. And I say that this morning not to be melodramatic or or to add emotion 
to my sermon, but, but to be honest, I mean, we think we have so much control over our lives. We think we, we know what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day, but we don't. We don't, and we need to know that God's word has something to say to us in those times. I mean, if, if the Bible and Christianity is just for when everything is going well, and hey, you're, you're middle class and comfortable, and, uh, and life is good, then wh- who cares? If there's nothing for you when, when life gets real, when, when things are painful and, and hurting, then why do we bother? Why do we come together? And so uh, this morning, I, I hope to share with you what God is saying to you and to us in those times, but uh, we, need, we need his help. Would, would you pray with me right now? Father, send your spirit on this church this morning. Send your spirit to me, Lord, that I would uh, faithfully share your word with uh, this congregation. Or that what I speak would be, would be you speaking to our hearts. And, and spirit, you are the comforter. And I pray you would be near to those who are hurting. Be near to our hearts. May we feel your presence uh, and your peace. As be so close to us as you whisper into our ears. Uh, of your, over your presence. Lord, we need you. We need you every day, but I ask for you especially right now. In Jesus' name, by his name we pray. Amen. So like I said, uh, this sermon was born out of a letter I wrote to my friend Chris. and uh, It was one Sunday morning. We were in worship. We were singing, and I felt God saying that he wanted me to share scripture with Chris but I didn't know what. I, my mind was blank. And so I kind of asked God, what do you want me to share? What do you want me to say? And I kind of like, I'm not used to expecting God to speak to me. And, and, and here, but almost immediately in my head popped Psalm 44. I am not familiar with Psalm 44. It's not a famous or a well-known psalm. Uh, it's definitely not my favorite psalm. Um, and so I kind of at first was like, is that just a, is that you, God? Is it a random book and chapter that just popped in my head? But the only way to, to find out was to read. So as we were singing all together, I sat down, I opened my, my Bible, and I turned to Psalm 44. Uh, so let's, let's read together. Oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You, with your own hand, drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. Selah. Selah is a Hebrew term used in the Psalms, and although we don't know exactly what it means, uh, the most reliable understanding is that it's a notation for some sort of musical interlude where the audience can pause while the music plays, and they can reflect on what's been said and sung so far. And in this case, they've sung, God is good. He has been faithful to our people in the past, and I will continue to trust him for my future. And here, I was looking to pass on advice to Chris, and I was feeling pretty good right now. Because um, when you're in a time of suffering, and you're looking for God to act, it, it is faith building to look at how God has acted in the past, whether in the Bible or in history or, or the, in our own life or the lives of those who are around us. I mean, that's one of the reasons we, we've been doing this sermon series, to see how God has acted in the lives of those in our congregation. Um, and our God is bringing deliverance all around us. And in times of trouble and suffering, we can point to his faithfulness and his grace in the past as fuel for our hope for his future grace. 
So like I said, at this point, I was feeling really good about what I was sharing with Chris. Clearly, God had spoken to me in selecting this psalm, and I had a lot of really good, really encouraging things to share with Chris. But then I read on, and things definitely took a nasty turn. Look at verse 9. But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for slaughter, and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face. At the sound of the taunter and reviler, at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. Okay, wow, that got dark really fast. Um, and at this, this point, I'm no longer excited to share this with Chris. I mean, if you're in advice mode, the advice, it just failed. Uh, I'm trying to encourage my friend. And here's the psalmist saying, yeah, I had hope, but God didn't come through for me. And he's not just casually saying it either. There's emotion here. And although I wasn't excited at this point to share with Chris, I had to appreciate that. I love that about the Psalms. They're raw. They're unafraid. They're real. And that's good because we live in reality. I know that there are some of you here who, like the psalmist, you can't say, I trusted God and everything got better. There are some of you here who you go back to the doctor and the diagnosis gets worse. There are those of you here I know who have desperately prayed for a friend and their healing and that friend died. There are some of you here who you pray and you do trust God. And that every day you wake up and the grief is still there. The stress is still there. The fear is still there. The, the pain is still there. The attacks, they keep coming. And it hurts. And you feel emotion. This is here. The psalmist, he feels disappointment. Look at verses 9 and 10. I hoped in you, God, but you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. God, I thought you were going to come through for us. We prayed for this. But you didn't. And now next time, it's going to be a lot harder to get my hopes up. Not only is there disappointment, there's anger too. You've made a sheep for the slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. I, I love the bitterness and the, the, the frustrated hyperbole there. It's like you're lining us up just to knock us all down. And the frustrated sarcasm in the next line. Uh, you have sold your people for a trifle, you, and, and demanding no high price for them. You sold us, God. I thought you loved us. I thought we were your children. But it looks like we weren't any more than slaves. We were prostitutes for you. You used us, and now you're done with us, and, and you don't care. And not only, did you not, not only did you sell us, but we weren't even valuable. It'd be one thing if you sold us to the highest bidder, and at least someone could uh, appreciate us, but no, you like, you practically gave us away. We were the throw-in at a garage sale. <laughs> you added insult to injury. And how many of you have felt that way? I, I, how many of you know, know this? I, I want you to see that the Bible, it doesn't shy away from real emotion, okay? You can be angry at God. You can share that with him. I don't want you to stay there. And in a little while, we're going we're gonna to get some perspective, and I hope you see that it doesn't quite make sense to be angry with God. But if that's how you're feeling, that's okay. You don't have to run from him. You don't have to hide it. He knows anyway, and he's not afraid. You're not going to scare him off. All right, God can use your anger to change you. And disappointment and anger, they aren't the only ways you might be feeling. I know that it often it feels embarrassing to suffer. It feels embarrassing.
embarrassing to be so helpless and so vulnerable. There's a good chance that many of you feel that way too. And the psalmist, he identifies that with that. He looks around at those that are mocking Israel, and he doesn't stand up to them. He doesn't say, yeah, you make fun of me, but I know where I am. I'm, I'm secure. No. He admits that he feels ashamed. They mock, and he covers his face. Now, I hope no one is openly taunting, to you, taunting you in your distress, but the embarrassment and shame are real. And you are being mocked. Again, probably not physically, but certainly spiritually. There are spiritual beings all around you who love that you're suffering, and they are having a field day, whispering in your ear every time you have a quiet moment. Did you really think God loved you? What a fool you were thinking God cared. Where's your God now? goodness, no wonder we're so tempted to to turn to things like alcohol and drugs and sexual pleasure and constant entertainment. Anything is better than having to listen to these voices, uh, these accusations. And I would bet one of the worst accusers is the voice that tells you, you know this is your fault, right? You know this wouldn't have happened if you weren't such a sinner. And that hits home. Because isn't that our own first response? That it's something we did? We, we, we say, God, what did I do to deserve this? I, I must have done something wrong to deserve this. It's, it's karma, right? And we all become Job's friends. Thinking and, and sometimes even saying, hey, God is just. There's, there must have been something you did to deserve this. We all do this. But look at what the psalmist in the psalm says next. He says, all this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you. And we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. The psalmist says, no, we were following God. This isn't about sin. We were doing everything right. You may be feeling this too. God, I was following you. I am following you. You were supposed to bless me. Doesn't the Bible say that there are blessings for those who obey God? It does say that. It does. And the Bible is also clear that suffering and sin are often very closely linked If you decide to go your own way rather than God's, this almost always leads to pain. For those of us who belong to Christ, if you you belong to Jesus, he has taken away your guilt. You are no longer condemned. You do not stand condemned. But God often doesn't take away the consequences of our sin. And this makes sense. When my son when he's irresponsible or he's reckless, whether, whether on purpose or on accident, I punish him. And, and it's not because I hate him or because I'm feeling vindictive. I love Ben, and I, I forgive him truly. But I don't withhold the consequences because I want him to learn. I want him to see that rebellion leads to pain. There are, so there are certainly times when your sin is the cause of your suffering but not always it wasn't that way for job it wasn't that way in luke chapter 13 when a number of people they died in a tragic accident and jesus said that it what they didn't die it wasn't because of their sin that that happened to them it wasn't that way for the people of israel in this psalm look life is complex and it's complicated There are, it it doesn't follow simple rules. Fortunately, we have a Bible and a God who is complex and complicated enough to fit real life. Seriously, sometime, take the time to to open your Bible to the middle and read through the four wisdom books. uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. See for yourself what a beautiful, 
beautifully multifaceted and deeply realistic picture of the dimensions and reasons for suffering that, that God gives. So as I make my own transition from giving advice to sharing what God is saying to you, here is the first thing I think God wants you to know this morning. He sees you. Okay? He sees you. You are not lost to him. You, even in the midst of all your pain and your messy emotions, you are not lost to him. Honestly, I think that's why this psalm is in the Bible. Remember that we believe that the Spirit of God inspired and shaped the, the songs and the words that are, are in our, our Bible. And he chose, God chose to include this chaotic, passion-filled rant against him. I don't, like, the only way that that makes sense to me, that God is willing to let in the, his Bible people rant against him, is because he wants us to see that he hears. He knows, okay? Uh, and just a heads up, this psalm, it doesn't get any tidier. In a lot of psalms, there's a turn. There's a moment when the psalmist can say, but I rest in my God. There isn't one of those in this psalm. Suffering is messy. It's messy and unresolved for him, and I'm guessing it's feeling really messy and really unresolved for you right now. What answers are there? God, do you care? What encouragement is there here? And, and as I wrote, tried to write to Chris, these are the th questions that I had, and I was stuck. But then I read the next verse, verse 22. Yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. I read that, and I stopped short. Now, some of you may be wondering why, because that is not an encouraging verse. <laughs> not at all. But I knew that verse. Do you recognize it? The Apostle Paul quotes that verse, that complaint, in the most famous chapter in the Bible. My favorite chapter in the Bible, Romans chapter 8. Really, you could argue that Romans 8 is the climax of the entire Bible. It's the pinnacle to which everything else is pointing. And that's when I saw the answer that God was providing in our suffering. Let's, let's turn and look. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans 8. Keep a finger in Psalm 44. We're going to come back. But to turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to skip through the beginning and, and start with verse 18. We've been looking at suffering and this is one of the places where God begins to give us some answers. Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We'll come back to this idea later, but I'll quickly mention that Paul is not saying this lightly. He's not just throwing this out there as an idea. He, Paul is a man who knew suffering. And yet he, he maintained that all that pain is simply, it's a glass of water in light of the massive river of God's coming glory. Okay, when you're measuring the flow of the Amazon River, you don't quibble over eight ounces. It's not worth comparing. And he goes on to say in verse 19, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, who groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. No hope that is seen is no hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Church, this is one pointer to the why of suffering. We suffer because we live in a broken world. Genesis 3 tells us that when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the creation itself became 
cursed. God created the world and it was good, but sin and rebellion have twisted it and mutated it. Cancer and viruses and heart attacks and miscarriages and suicide and murder and disabilities and earthquakes and freak accidents and deep-rooted systems of oppression, they are all a consequence of the fall. And they happen to us because we live in this fallen world. So when we ask why we suffer, the Bible is clear that it may not have been our specific sin that led to our suffering, but sin is still the root cause of suffering. So here we have an answer for why there's suffering. We suffer because this world is broken. And my goodness, I have to say today, do you need any more evidence that this world is broken than this past month? This past week in our nation, racism and hatred and murder, gosh, our souls were crying out for, with the weight of this brokenness. But here, church, the, here is the ultimately the good news of the gospel. God has promised that one day he will fix it. One day, sooner than we imagine, he will set things right. You see, far too often in our Christian circles, we make the gospel and salvation way too personal. Jesus died for me and for my sins, and soon I will go to heaven and be with him. But the real story of salvation is so much better, so much bigger than this. The entire universe is affected, and all of creation will be set free from the curse that has been burdened under the salvation that Jesus brings is cosmic. There is coming a day when there will be no more pain. There will no longer be any such thing as cancer or divorce or death. There will be no more racism. There will be no more disability. There is coming a day when justice will be done and bodies will be resurrected. And those of you in wheelchairs... Those of you who are bedridden, you will walk and you will run and you will cartwheel with all of humanity as we worship God, our Savior. Amen. Now this doesn't mean as Christians that we just sit back and wait. We, not at all. We fight for justice. We fight for righteousness and against oppression. We fight against disease and against disability. But as you fight, know that the end of pain is coming. It's, it's coming and all of creation is anticipating it. Hold on to that hope and let that build patience in you. Let's read on. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We're in verse 26. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes the saints according to the will of God. Unfortunately, for time's sake, I do, I'm not going to go much into these verses except to point out the, at the vocabulary of weakness and groaning. God meets you where you are. You, we, are weak. And not only is that okay, but that's where God loves to meet us. And, and even though we can't form words to cry out to him, he is there. And the spirit of God is groaning along with us. God hears you. Now look at verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Here is where we're going to camp out for a little bit because here is the second thing that God wants you to know. He will redeem your suffering. He will redeem your suffering. Hear me, church. God will cause you to harvest joy from the seeds of your pain. This is the promise of God that I pray sinks deep, deep into the soil of your soul. I'm sure you've heard this verse before. It's on coffee mugs. It's on wall decals. It's everywhere. But hear it fresh today. 
as the, as the God of the universe whispering over your life. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Before we move on, though, I, I have to pause and give a hard but important side note. I know this verse is everywhere. You'll see people quoting it and referring to it all the time. And it's fundamental to a lot of people's outlook on life. But I want you to see that it has a very critical context. This promise is for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. Paul wants us, us to see, and he'll make clear in a few verses, that this promise is not just wishful thinking. It is not just optimism or faith in the universe or faith in a generic God. The foundation and the only reason that this promise can stand is because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And this promise is only for those who love Jesus and are following him. And so critically, I want to be brutally honest and very clear here. If you have not trusted Jesus as your God and as your Savior, if you have not given him your life and have, are following him as a disciple, this promise is not for you. Your suffering is not working together for your good. Your suffering is working toward your destruction. In fact, it, it could even be seen as a foretaste of the suffering that comes from being separated from God eternally. There are some of you in this room right now listening to me who currently stand in that situation. I want to let that sink in because the best thing I can do for you is to tell you the truth. And the best thing you can do is honestly assess where you're standing before your God. Where are you headed? Here, though, is where I get to come back to the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. The, the message of this whole book and the, the good news is that we were all in that sa situation. We were all condemned, but God moved. He acted, and he sent his son to be our sacrifice and to stand in our place and to give us life through following him. Today, you can move from destruction into life. And it will turn out that God is using your suffering for your eternal good. And there is hope for you today, and I pray that you turn to Jesus, look at him, and live. If that stirred something in you, or if you have questions, please come talk to me afterwards or talk to one of our pastors. We would love to walk through that with you and, and talk with you. And when you have turned to Christ, then this promise, this wonderful promise is for you. What you're going through, the pain and suffering that you are feeling, is God will use it for your good. This promise says that no matter how dark things seem, even if they end in your death, they will be turned for your good. Look at what this says. All things work together for good. All things. Every single thing. And this is important this is important because I know that for many of you who are suffering right now, you feel like your life is being wasted, or that your life has been ruined. You had dreams. You had hopes. You had hopes for your life and your future and for your family. And now those dreams, they're either completely gone or they're at least very deeply diminished. And while I want to, I hope we all, we want to stand with you and weep with you today, I also want to gently push back and say, no, no, your life is not wasted. It's not wasted. I want to invite you to let the Spirit lift your gaze, lift your head and gaze beyond this short, curse-stained life and into eternity with our Savior Jesus. Church, this life that we're living right now is just a dot at the beginning of a line that extends far beyond the horizon. The, uh, your life is not over. It is not wasted by your suffering, no matter your circumstances. Your life is just beginning. These pains, 
no matter how big they feel to you, no matter how big they, no, how, no matter how big they are, they are no more than the tiny invisible workings inside a seed that will later grow into a mighty oak that stands in worship for God for all eternity. Our God is a good father, and somehow he turns mourning into dancing. And, and not necessarily in this life, but I don't but don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in that. This life is passing away. And behold, he is making all things new. This verse tells us that God is using your sorrow right now for your ultimate joy. Look at that word purpose. God has a plan. He brought this forth in your life for a reason. And I please hear me, I don't mean that in a trite, everything happens for a reason kind of way. We probably will not understand that reason, okay? It's beyond us. But the bedrock promise of God is that your suffering is not meaningless. He will redeem your sufferings. So how can we be sure this will happen? I mean, why can we trust this? Uh, This is where I love Paul. Paul is a very logical thinker. And though a lot of what we believe takes faith and it takes trust, it's never a blind faith or an unthinking trust. And so he's going to develop an argument. Why can we trust this promise? Look at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. This is Paul's logic. He says, look at what God has already done. You, Christian, were predestined, called, and justified. Why would you not also be glorified? Why wouldn't he finish the job? God didn't spare his own son. Jesus came and he did the hardest work for our salvation and our good. You think he's going to leave us stranded now? That doesn't make any sense. Look, Paul says, God has already given us his son. Of course he's going to give us everything else. And who can stand in his way? God himself is completely for us. There is nothing, nothing and no one that can get in the way now of our father finishing the job. This is the context of these most famous verses. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Shall any of these separate us from Christ? I know we tend to rush past this list because the climax here is so compelling, but this is not a casual list. There were people that Paul was writing to who were facing these things. They were being persecuted and killed. They were starving and dying in the streets because of life in this cursed world. And because of their faith. And they were wondering if God was really there. Does he really care? And these are still happening around the world uh, today to real Christians in real places. And though they look a little bit different for us here in Visalia today, I know many of you are asking the same questions. Am I separated from the love of Christ? Shall debt or cancer or depression or hunger, or disability, or abandonment, or lung failure? Verse 36, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. There it is, guys. There's our verse. Remember all the pain, and the frustration, and the anger, and the shame that the psalmist was feeling? Remember the hopelessness of his position? This is what Paul points to. At the climax of the entire Bible, 
He says, remember him? Remember this guy. Remember he thought he was far from God. He thought God had abandoned him. And there, there was nothing anymore for him. And to him, to you, God says through Paul, no. Isn't that wonderful? No. No, you are not separate. You are not cut off. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Nothing, church. That's the answer. Nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. His disciples are His. They are in His hands and you will not be separated. This is our rest. This is our promise. You, right now, are secure. You are safe. Your whole world may be rocking and spinning around you, but this foundational truth of who you are has not, and it will not change. You belong to Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. And as good as it is, it gets better. It gets better. Look at this. He says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So what does that mean to be more than conquerors? I think in this context, to, to conquer something would mean to beat it, right? Um, what, so y to beat it, you get through it. Yeah, cancer may have really messed me up. It, it may even have killed me. But, but we got through it. And we are now united with Christ. This is great news. You, through Christ, can beat cancer in an eternal sense. Because of what God has done, you will emerge victorious. But the news gets even better. Because what does it mean to more than conquer something? I think to more than conquer something means you don't just beat it, but you subdue it. You, it gets not just passed through, but used for even more victory. The trial becomes something that leads to even deeper joy and greater good than we would have had without it. Isn't this what Paul has said before? He said that, those for those who that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Listen, church. God's promise is not that he will get you through your suffering. As good as a promise as that would be. No, God's promise is that he will redeem your suffering. He will use it constructively. That is praiseworthy good news. I told you at the beginning that I was going to proclaim to you today what God says to your suffering. And I think I have. But notice what he did not say. He didn't tell you why you specifically are suffering. He didn't give you answers for your situation. And he may not. Okay? I know that God does speak to us, and for many of us, we can look back at a time in our life where there was pain, and we can see what God ha did with it and how God has used it for our good. But I want to encourage you not to depend on that. God may not give you an answer. That's not always his way. Notice, notice he didn't give an answer to the psalmist. We had to wait at least 400 years for God's response to come. That psalmist may have died without seeing the answer. And remember Job in his suffering. He asks God, why is this happening to me? He demands that God answer him. And God doesn't give it to him. God instead questions Job, who are you? Were, were you there at the foundation of the world? What makes you think you can question me? And Job falls on his face before him. God here is not giving us an answer, but he is speaking to us. He's saying, trust me. Trust me. 
I have promised you that I am working all things for your good. I am God who never lies, and I've given you my son. I've told you there's nothing in all of creation that can separate you from me. You are safe, even though you don't feel like it. Trust me. Behold, I am making all things new. Hear God today, church. Hear his words, his whisper over your troubled soul. You are seen. You are safe. You're not alone. Your life is not wasted. I will redeem your suffering. So as we close, how do we respond? I'm going to throw out a couple things. For that, we're going to turn back to Psalm 44 and see how that ended. Verse 23. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. So a couple quick observations. First, in your suffering, let the character of God, who he is, inform your circumstances rather than letting your circumstances inform your view of the character of God. Notice how the psalmist appeals to God's character in that last verse. Even though he doesn't see it right now in his circumstances, he knows that Yahweh is a God of steadfast love. And secondly, like the psalmist, cry out to God. If you're hurting, pray. Pray for healing. Pray for a miracle. Keep calling him. God loves to answer. He does do miracles. He, the kingdom of God is now. He does heal. And just as a quick close to my story about my friend Chris, he waited in the hospital for a, mung, a lung transplant for over a month. And th- as a result of it taking so long, they went for a second opinion. And they did scans of his lungs. And the doctors were like, oh, we actually don't see any of the damage anymore. You don't need a transplant after all. And somehow, somehow God ha- had healed. And so right now, Chris is living his life with his own lungs. And, and he's doing well. God can heal. And I pray that he will heal you today. And so we cry out to God, but, but as we cry out to God, we do so from the foundation of, God, of the cross. As we ask God to act, we need to know that he already has acted in the most real way. You don't plead as one who has no hope. Even if he does not heal, because the truth is, God sometimes chooses not to. The kingdom is not yet. It's now, but it's not yet. We talked about that tension. But he has not left you. He will redeem this pain. So choose joy. Choose joy today. Not because your faith will make good things happen. Not because having a positive attitude brings blessings. Nowhere does God say that this redemption depends on your feelings. The psalmist, he obviously doesn't have a positive and cheery attitude. No. Choose joy not to get something from it, but because it's true. God will redeem your suffering. Choose joy because despair doesn't make sense when we have a God who has promised our joy. You, today, can use your suffering to show the watching world that your health is not your God. Your family is not your God. Your dreams are not your God. Even life itself is not your God. God is your God, and He is your hope, and He is your true joy. And in these verses, we see that He promises that that no matter what you lose, you will not lose him. And when you do this, I guarantee that he will fi- you will find joy now. This redemption of your suffering, it does begin now. As Daniel and Rennell share with, saying for us from Psalm 27, you will see goodness in the land of the living. You won't have to wait until you die to experience the joy and the comfort of his presence. He is near to you. So I know that that's not saying choose joy. That's not easy. That's really, really hard. And so the last thing we do is we cry out to God, help, like, like the father in go- Mark's gospel, I believe, help my unbelief. We cannot do this ourselves. We need his grace, and his grace is enough for you. So as we end today, we're going to sing a song, and, and there are several of us up here who uh, – are here to pray for you and to cry with you. Uh, But don't be too quick to rush up here. 
we are a body, and each of you, as qualified as I am to preach these truths to each other, mourning with those who mourn is a call to all of us. So I would encourage you to reach out to those who are around you and share with each other, minister to each other. Before we do that, though, um, I think the best way we can apply what we've learned is to proclaim the truth loudly through song. We are one body with different parts, so let's sing together with the strength that comes from Christ and our eternal hope. For those of you who are feeling strong this morning and life is good, we need you. We need you to sing loudly, to speak truth over those who need to hear it. But then I also, I hope that those of you who are suffering, those of you who come, came this morning in deep pain, uh, those that you're, you are most aware of the pain in this present world. And I hope that you, you will sing the loudest and thereby minister to us all of the hope of the world to come. So let's rejoice together, church. Let's, let's sing together. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. I